be continuing um, my series in the book of Mark, and we come to um, the point that is right before the crucifixion of Christ, just a few days before the crucifixion of Christ. And after the Lord Jesus went into the city, remember on the triumphal entry, we, we talked about this, how they shouted, Hosanna, blessed he is coming in the name, who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus went to the temple and unexpectedly, he made it very plain to everyone that was in earshot of what he said in the temple, when he walked into that temple, God was not pleased with the behavior of the religious crowd that was there. Those religious people that were there Thought they were spiritual, but in fact, before God, they were not. And we saw how Jesus spoke and how he likened the people that were there to being like fig trees with leaves that had the appearance that they would have fruit, but they had none. They were actually barren. In Mark 11, we saw how in righteous anger, Jesus overturned the money tables and he drove the people out who had turned the court of the temple set aside for the Gentiles into a place of marketing. The religious authorities were indignant. When Jesus spoke up and he did this, he overturned the temples and he got everyone to go. And he says, you've made my house a den of robbers when it's supposed to be a house of prayer. The, the religious leaders that were running the system and had set up the system the way it was, they were indignant. See, the money changers were making Millions. Now, not in, I mean, they didn't have our money, so it's not dollars, but equivalent of millions. They were raking in millions, and the largest cut was going to the religious leaders. And in a true sense, the, um, the religious leaders were actually requiring the Jewish people to pay huge amounts of money just to worship. In order to fulfill the law correctly, they were made to pay so much. Temple officials and the whole system of religious leadership. They were pocketing millions every Passover. And when Jesus confronted this great evil, he actually struck a hornet's nest. And because Jesus threatened the comfort of their lifestyle and their positions of honor, the religious leaders, they didn't just want him out of there, they wanted him dead. So after this, we see, we're reading in Mark 11, they tried to trick him. They were so desperate, desperate at this point to try and get the people to turn against him. They set a trap. And they publicly asked Jesus by whose authority he had done the things that he had done in the temple. And, um, you know, when you look at the life of Jesus leading up to this point, what he had been doing as he came into Jerusalem before he came into Jerusalem, it's not like he was hiding his miracles from public view. The great miracles being displayed in his ministry leading up to this point where he had come into the temple. They spoke for themselves. God was with him. There could be no doubt. For who could call out to a dead man that had been dead for four days in a tomb and say, Lazarus, come forth. Unless the power of God was being displayed. And no doubt, the people recognized this Upon his entry, and they cried, Hosanna, and they laid down palm branches. Blessed is the son of David, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. When Jesus came in on the triumphal entry. But in response to all of this, the, the religious leaders, they're threatened. And they asked Jesus this trick question, but Jesus asked them, he asked them, well, was John the Baptist baptizing under the authority of God or not? And they just, oh, they got taken off guard. Jesus answered them in a way that they would have to commit themselves to, to speak and to, uh, and to commit themselves to, to say yes or no. And if they said no, the people would riot against them. And they, these, these religious guys were all about power and control and all about the outward polish. They wanted to keep it intact. 
They wanted control over the people. So they didn't want to say no because they knew that people thought that John was a, was a prophet. And if they said yes, he was a prophet, then Jesus could say to them, well, then why didn't you believe what he said about me? Because you remember when Jesus Christ came to the, to the river Jordan to be baptized by John, and when he went under the water, and he came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit came down upon him in bodily form like a dove, and the voice of the Father God said from heaven, this is my son in whom I am, my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So if the leaders said yes, he could say, well, what was the testimony of John when he saw who I was and where I came from? What was the testimony? And all the witnesses. So they said, we don't know. We don't know. And Jesus says, then I'm not going to tell you what authority by which I'm speaking. So, sometimes in our, in our, in our English Bibles, right, we have, we have chapter divisions. But in the original manuscript, there's no chapter divisions. It, one flows into the other, okay? So this whole thing where we got the temple being cleared, we got Jesus in chapter 11, right? His authority is questioned. And, 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 uh, you know, we, we've got that happening, and it flows right into chapter 12. So instead of answering these guys and, get, and telling them by whose authority he was operating under, Jesus told them a parable. Now, most of us are aware here that a parable, you know, a parable is a spiritual truth that is brought forth from a very practical, physical story, a story that people could relate to. So that's what Jesus did. In response to all this, in Mark chapter 12, and we'll start reading with verse 1. Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put around a wall, he put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. So let's pause here for a minute. So Jesus opens this parable. In the beginning of the parable, Jesus sets the stage. And the religious leaders who were listening to Jesus' story, they weren't unfamiliar with the prophetic books of, of the Old Testament. And what Jesus just spoke right there in the first verse was very familiar to them. They would have realized immediately that the story, parable that Jesus was starting to tell them, paralleled and was very similar to a passage of scripture written by the prophet Isaiah. And in Isaiah chapter 5, the prophet describes God in the same manner as being the owner of a vineyard which had been planted in the soil of the earth. And the vines in his vineyard story, in Isaiah's vineyard story, represented all of the tribes of Israel. Isaiah wrote a parable song to this, actually. If you, we're not going to read out chapter 5 of Isaiah, but it's a good thing to go to. I'd say after this, go read that. Isaiah chapter 5, I'll just read the first two verses. Uh, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on the fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut a wine press out of it as well. And he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. And in the following verses of Isaiah chapter 5, he proclaimed that because this vineyard that was planted was producing bad fruit, God, the righteous owner of the vineyard, would actually for a time abandon what he had planted. He would remove his hedge of protection from Israel and permit it to be overrun by enemies and destroyed. And historically speaking, we see this. Right after Isaiah's prophecy was given, Israel was judged by God. And sadly, because of their disobedience, they were sent into exile to both Assyria and Babylon. 
Now, consider what had taken place with Jesus confronting all of the merchanting that was being done in his temple courts. What Jesus saw happening in the temple was not evidence of the fruit of righteousness that God desired. But it was a perversion of God's true intention for the temple system and the nation which he himself had planted and had given his protection to. From the temple mount in the court of the Gentiles, see Jesus had gone away from the temple after turning the tables over. Now he went out and then he went back in. And this is where the questioning was happening. In the court of the Gentiles where Jesus was standing on the temple mount and began to tell his story, his parable here, you could see the Mount of Olives literally covered with grapevines in the distance. In addition, we are told in history that the majestic temple that Herod built, the, the doorway leading into the holy place in the temple courtyard, they were in the court of the Gentiles talking, and the, most, and the holy place was here. And right over top of the holy place was this giant, beautifully ornate grapevine that was carved into the stone. And the grape leaves were, were, were covered in gold and silver. And the grape clusters were made of precious stones. So you, you can see, so on the left, or on the right, you see Jesus looking up on, he's telling the story about the, the vine, vineyard, or vineyard, and on the Mount of Olives is, is, are these vines that are planted. You could see in the distance. And on, in the temple itself was this huge ornate thing. The grapevine was lavishly embellished. The history books tell us that often wealthy Jews would add another expensive leaf or another precious stone to that vine. So the setting was Im, uh, unmistakable. In the historical reference of similarity of what Jesus was saying to Israel's present leadership in comparison with Israel's leadership in the time of Isaiah was, was so similar. And the Jewish leaders, they had no doubt about what Jesus was talking about in this parable. He had just told them that he wasn't going to tell them by which authority that he was speaking. There was this conflict, and it was public. Jesus was talking about the people of God as being the vineyard which God had established on the earth. And the religious authorities were the farmers who were granted the right to tend to the health of God's people, the vineyard. And they were given that right for the purpose of producing a harvest of the fruit of the vine, the fruit of righteousness Represented by the grape crop. You see, God doesn't plant a, a, a vineyard solely like we look at a flower garden. God plants the vineyard not just to be nice to look at, although it is. God plants it for a very practical purpose. He desires that good fruit would come from his planting. That there would be a harvest of righteousness. When God established his people, he provided protection by putting a wall of, around his people to protect them from harm. As the creator and, and the owner of this beautiful vineyard, he had established ten commandments and the law of Moses to surround the people, to, and, and to surround the people and keep them safe from the wild spiritual evil outside of the camp that would want to come in and otherwise, without that protection, pillage wild animals, enemies that would steal away the fruit that God desired. So he put this hedge of protection in his law. around. He put a watchtower up so that his appointed watchman could say, hey, look out, this is coming. Beware. Be on guard. Prepare. The farmers would have the opportunity to prepare themselves for any kind of attack from the outside. See, this is the purpose of the wall and the watchtower and God's, and God's watchmen. God invested his energy into making this beautiful vineyard. He dug a pit for the wine press. 
carved into solid rock. One shallow pit where bunches of grape, this is how they did it when they had a vineyard. One shallow pit where they would crunch the grapes down and the grape juice would flow down into another, into another pit where the, where the juice would be held and the, and the wine would be made. And they would gather it from that point into the storehouses. You see, my friends, my friends, children of God, God has a taste for righteousness. He has a taste for righteousness. He's a holy God, and he loves to see the fruit of righteousness in the people that he created. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. And, and this wine represents the collective harvest of righteousness flowing from the people that he created. And from the beginning, this was his desire in planting and establishing Israel as his chosen ambassadors to the earth. That was his plan. And he built a watchtower for shelter, storage, as a vantage point. God thought about everything. He has the wall. He has the vines. He has the press. He's got the storage. He thought about everything. Now, a vineyard doesn't establish a good grape harvest overnight. If you know anything about growing grapes, it's not like you plant grapes, right, you know, like right away here, and then all of a sudden you got to harvest that fall. Now, grape, grape vines take time to produce good fruit. They need to be tended to. They need to be pruned when necessary. They need to be lovingly cared for. And, and the master knows, the master vine keeper knows what needs to be done for the health of the vine so that they produce good fruit. But God also is generous. He permits people to partake with him in his work. He permitted the spiritual leaders of the people of Israel who were appointed to manage his vineyard while he was away. While he was away, he let them take management of the affairs of his vineyard. He leased it out to them. Now his desire wasn't that you know, they didn't benefit from any of the fruit of righteous living that would come from the people while he was away. No, he, he intended for them to share in the bountiful harvest of righteousness that would be coming in and be, be coming in at its proper time. So the, the, the spiritual leaders could benefit from the, the fruit of righteousness. You, you know, like any leader can tell you of any church, that when the people are following Jesus and they're bearing good fruit, it flows over to you. It's a blessing. But look, make no mistake about it. Spiritual leaders do not own the fruit. It is the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of the leaders. The fruit of the Spirit. We have been caretakers placed in charge of God's vineyard. And this is in this setting in the Old Testament. You see what's happening here? Jesus had just overturned the money tables. There was not good fruit. As a matter of fact, in the case that Jesus was speaking at that particular time, because the fig tree parable was right before this, there was just leaf there was no fruit. It had all the appearance of life and all the appearance of abundance, but had no fruit of righteousness. It was thoroughly corrupted. So, Jesus, you think he had the religious leader's attention with the background that they understood with the Old Testament? Absolutely. They understood Jesus is taking us to task here. God was understood as being the owner of the vineyard. The nation of Israel was understood to be the vineyard itself. And they were the farmers. They were the farmers. The farmers hired by the owner to care for the vineyard. And this meant that they were to tend to the vines and keep the protective walls and tower in good order. They had been given the responsibility of ensuring 
that everything they did facilitated good fruit production from the vineyard for the benefit of who? The benefit of the owner. They'd also benefit, but it was ultimately the owner's vineyard. They were temporarily placed in charge and called to selflessly protect his interest until he returned. But Jesus continues in the parable in verse 2, and he says, at harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man in the head and treated him shamefully. He still sent another, and this one they killed. That one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. Throughout the 1,400 years of Israel up to that point, the farmers who, who tended this vineyard for God had shown themselves ultimately to be a very greedy bunch. The religious leaders, they weren't concerned with pleasing God so much as they were interested in pleasing themselves. And God, and God sent some prophets to them. Somewhere along the way, the tenants decided that they wanted to be the owners. So they took over the vineyard. And over and over, God sent his servants, the prophets, them, to them. And over and over again, the nations, through its leaders, rejected God's messengers. Rather than responding graciously, they beat them. They killed them. We see about this in Hebrews. It's written in Hebrews 11, 37, and 38. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes in the ground. Even John the Baptist, the greatest one of their order, the last and the greatest of their order, was put to death by beheading. Because on behalf of God, he stood up to the wicked behavior of King Herod. And because of that, he called Herod out and he lost his head. Jesus continues. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, They will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him, and they killed him, and they threw him out of the vineyard. So when Jesus came to the earth, Jesus was proclaimed by the Father that he indeed was the Son, and that he, in fact, was the Messiah that was the start of Jesus' ministry. The baptism was the start, the initiation into Jesus' earthly ministry. Past that point. This was the same Jesus who had healed all these sick people and raised the dead. Did all these wonderful miracles. The same Jesus who was so gentle and kind to the people that were lost lambs. He got angry at the religious people who were devoid of fruit. He got angry. He exposed the greed of the farmers who had been hired to look at the, after the vineyard of Israel. And when the son came to the temple on behalf of the father... Instead of finding a temple, being the temple being a place of prayer for all nations, he found an elaborate system of religious leaders growing fat off the millions in proceeds that they were making by overcharging for what they were doing. And Jesus stopped them by clearing out the temple. <laughs> Ultimately, he cut off the gravy train. Oh, and they were like, how dare he? How dare this man say that he is special? 
How dare he say that he could be the Messiah? How dare he? Don't stop our embezzled funds or we will kill you. Don't mess with our Passover prophets or you're going to die. See? Dead religion, my friends, is all about money, power, and control. Pure religion flows from looking upon those who are broken. Orphans, widows, the oppressed, the afflicted, and stepping in and becoming a healing balm for them. This is God's way. In two days, these very listeners would haul Christ before their own Jewish authorities and condemn him. They'd arrange for his death outside of the city, symbolically outside of the vineyard, right? So that the vineyard would be theirs alone. They are about to kill Christ and incur God's eternal wrath on them for their evil actions. My friends, we can't dismiss the obvious here. There was no good fruit. They weren't really concerned about God. They were only interested in making their life better by profiteering from the work of Christ or from the work of God at this time. They're leafy. Yep, they had all the flash. They wore the robes. They had all the appearance of life. Beautiful, ornate carvings everywhere. Pillars. Jesus spoke up against this evil. He confronted the system for what it was. And they hated him. And they thought that they would trap him in their words. They thought they would trap him in his words, I should say. They did not respect the Son of God, as this parable suggests, whom the Father had sent to them. And Jesus said, what will the owner of the vineyard do? In verse 9. He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. And saying this, like Isaiah prophetically predicted the exile of Israel to Babylon and Assyria, Jesus predicted that because of their rejection of him, the temple system would be dismantled and the vineyard would be given to others. In AD 70, what happened? After Jesus was crucified, after he rose from the dead and ascended back into heaven, his prophetic words became a reality. The Roman legions under the leadership of Titus utterly laid waste to the temple that Jesus was standing in telling this parable. The old temple system was completely destroyed and that temple lays in ruins to this very day. In verse 10, Haven't you read the passage of Scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in his eyes. Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders look for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. You know, you know who the chief cornerstone was? Jesus. You know what a cornerstone is? A cornerstone is a perfect stone that sets the symmetry, stability, and direction of an entire building in the ancient world. And builders would reject stone after stone after stone until they found the perfect stone to function as the cornerstone, which would then set up the entire building. Now, Jesus, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. But he is a stone that the builders or these farmers were rejecting. The Lord is telling us in the Old Testament, already prophesied that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, would be rejected. When we look at Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected, a man from whom men hide their faces. We esteemed him not. But 
But the Lord tells us here, the builder's rejected cornerstone has become the cornerstone. And who has done this? The Lord has done this. And it is marvelous in our eyes. You see, there was, an old, there was a problem with the old covenant that needed to be changed. In Psalm 19, 7, David declares the law of the Lord is perfect. The law of God is perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect, he says, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. So the problem isn't with the, the law. The old covenant law was good, and it reflected the very character of God. Yet, it's written in the book of Hebrews, right? We are told that the law made nothing perfect. And as such, God through Jesus brought a new and a better covenant into being. Jesus became the foundational cornerstone for a new and a better covenant, a new and a better building, a new and a better vineyard. In Hebrews 7.19, we read, For the law made nothing perfect, and a better hope is introduced, by which we draw near to God. See? The law that was being so poorly managed by Israel's spiritual leaders, because they were trying in their own strength to do it, the law showed that they were incapable of doing it. You know, the law shows us what it shows us. It shows us how much we're incapable of earning favor with God. We can't earn favor with God. See, the law was never given to redeem sinners. It's not... God's law that makes us righteous, but his grace. And then we obey the law because his grace is given to us to change our hearts. If you try to obey the law on the outside, the law is good. But you're not going to be able to do it. These religious leaders weren't able to do it. This is why the vineyard was corrupted and, and what it, it wasn't working. Romans 3.20, Paul tells the people in Romans 3.20, therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. You can't earn your way. You can't be good enough. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. <laughs> Titus 3, 5 and 6 says he saved us. Not because of the righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. So the law was set as a standard and a means for revealing sin to us for what it is. It was an impeccable teacher. It was a tutor, though. In reality, it was a tutor pointing us to our need for Christ, that we might be justified that we might be just as if we had never sinned by his grace. We see that after Jesus died on the cross and rose again, he started his church and he established it on new foundations. See, God wasn't pleased with the outcome of the old foundation, so he made himself the cornerstone of a new spiritual temple not made with the hands of humans. Along with himself, he would utilize construction materials of the prophets and the apostles whom he chose to lay the foundation for a new temple. The temple, the old temple system was not producing fruit. It was a vineyard that was devoid of fruit. So it was replaced by a new covenant in the Son of God. The vineyard, the place where the fruit of righteousness would grow. You see what I'm saying? The fruit of righteousness? You, you, can't, you can't grow the fruit of righteousness on your own. 
It is not your fruit, my friends. It is the fruit of the Spirit. And it is only manifest in sinful human beings when that sinful human being's spirit has been cleansed by the living God through the blood of Jesus in the new covenant of his blood. We are the righteousness of God in Christ, a brand new creation in him. Old things are passed away when we come to Jesus and we lay our, 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 ourselves down before him and we say, Jesus, take my sin. Take my life and let it be, Lord, consecrated to you. When that happens, spiritual life begins and the Spirit begins His good work. And a result of the Spirit of Christ inside of His people, there is good fruit that comes from that. And it is the fruit of the Spirit. It is not the fruit of Clint. It is not your fruit. It is the fruit of the Spirit. It is not by works, lest anyone should boast, but by God's grace alone that is done in the power of His Holy Spirit. And we have to be reminded of this because we, we look at the Old Testament and we sometimes, we sometimes graft the Old Testament into our New Testament lives. The Old Testament was meant to show us that we cannot, we cannot earn our way to God. We cannot be good enough on our own effort. But in the Spirit, God changes hearts and he changes desires. And I'm not saying that you... Once you're saved by faith in Christ, that you just say, oh, I'm not going to do anything good anymore. I'm saved. Oh, God forbid. God forbid that. But if you fall in love with Jesus, which you will if the Spirit of Christ lives in you, the resulting thing that happens is that you will bear good fruit. So Jesus told this parable. And told them, I'm going to put the vineyard under new management, guys. God's going to put the, the vineyard under new management. No, nope. Israel's not finished. But they were set aside for a season while the church, made up of people of all nations and all tongues, seek to fulfill the purpose that God has for his people in the world. And that is to produce good fruit everywhere in this vineyard that is his. Under the old covenant system, the place of prayer for us as Gentiles was corrupted by the greed of Israel's spiritual leaders. But now a way has been... You see the connection between the overturning of the temples? This is all one narrative. Now a new place has been made for us, for all men of every tribe and tongue all over the world to come to God in prayer because the temple is no longer a physical thing. You come to church, but this is not the temple. The temple is inside of you if you are one of Christ's. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost and he dwells within you and the fruit of righteousness comes from your communion with him. <laughs> and I'm just going to read this passage of scripture and close. In 1 Peter chapter 2, and this ties in so well. It, God's word is beautiful. It's so beautiful. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and a precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now you, to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And the stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they, will diso they disobey the message, which also is what they were destined for. But you, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Isn't that beautiful? What a beautiful tie-in. Jesus Name above all names. Beautiful Savior.
glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us. Blessed Redeemer, living word. Amen. Would you bow in prayer with me today?